by the military industrial complex. And now the Taliban will pay a price. Do we have the confidence to do in the Middle East what our fathers and grandfathers accomplished in Europe and Asia? The situation in Afghanistan is deteriorating. What I do oppose is a dumb war. All right, welcome back to the boardwalk. This is episode 19. Can't believe we've actually gotten this far. Um, today we're, well, first of all, we're joined once again by Mitch Chahalis, newly married Mitch Chahalis. So all of our female fans, tough shit. Um, all all three, yeah, all three of them. It's a, it's a bunch of old like camo guys and like three girls. Um, <laughs> so for... For this episode, if you watched a lot of the news, and this is not going to be a current events episode like the last couple of weeks, but the the idea behind it is rooted in current events. And we talked about it a little bit over the last two weeks where, you know, I'm watching the news and uh, what I was saying before we hit record, the record button, the, the national security correspondent for Fox News uh, came out and asked, immediately following the uh, the VBIT attack, whether it meant the Taliban would have to fight the Akani network. And, well, that's just stupid. And that information is widely available. So at least for the first half of this episode, we're going to talk about specifically the relationship between the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and the Haqqani network. Because for, for some reason, people keep buying this, this I'm not going to call it a lie, Although I mean, uh, it kind of is a lie, but this this misinformation that the groups are not associated with each other, kind of like the misinformation that we decimated Al Qaeda to the point that we accomplished our mission. Well, we were accomplishing that mission, and then we did a complete one eighty, did coin, and Mitch was here for that episode, so we won't rehash that one, right? But so yeah, let's get into it. So I guess we'll start with the history of Al Qaeda. Yeah, yeah that sounds good. Start. Okay, so. Like most groups that operate in Afghanistan, Al Qaeda's origins go back to the Mujahideen, and it's even evident in the Afghan national anthem. Well, the current one, I'm sure the Taliban might. Well, they probably won't change it because they don't like music; they'll just remove it. Um, but the Afghan national anthem mentions like 30 different races or ethnicities, and includes the Arabs. And that's a reference to the Arab Afghans, those who came to Afghanistan to fight the Soviets during the Soviet-Afghan War, who were part of the Mujahideen. And, and really, in a nutshell, that's where Al-Qaeda comes from. Osama bin Laden came over. He was a disciple of the Muslim Brotherhood, which started in Egypt, uh, started at, at a, by Hassan al-Banna, who was really concerned that where he was living at in Egypt was becoming westernized, and British colonialism or imperialism was stripping Egypt of its Muslim identity, Saeed Qutb took that a step further when he became one of the more prominent figures in the Muslim Brotherhood. He wrote Milestones. It's considered by many to be like, you know, the the original or the, the, the first uh, publish, you know, first publishing of any sort of material that really radicalized people. You go from there and you fast forward to the 80s. We're in Afghanistan. Well, the Soviets are in Afghanistan. Bin Laden rolls in, hardline disciple of Saeed Qutb with deep, deep pockets. Okay, and and that's like, and like we have said before, that's where he really got his his power from. Was uh, he he wasn't he wasn't ever really a, a great fighter, but he was a devout disciple of this of this Saeed Qutb inspired Salafist Wahhabism. Used those pockets to develop connections and relationships with Pakistani ISI with the Mujahideen. And that's how we got Al Qaeda. So, is it important to note um, that that Al Qaeda is much more of a, like you said earlier, these these Arabs in Afghanistan, much more of an Arab inspired version of, of traditionalist Islam rather than a, I don't know, a traditional Afghan Islamic society. True, and they stood up there in Afghanistan, but that wasn't their headquarters in 2011. They moved around a little bit, and some of that was in Africa and in other parts of the Middle East as well. Yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of funny side note. A lot of, a lot of the uh, like historical records and uh, 
uh, interviews with Afghans that were involved with the Mujahideen at the time kind of talk shit about the <laughs> the Arabs that came over. They're, you know, they're they're not really they're not really great fighters, but they're they're kind of here. But you know, Afghans are taking care of our own shit. Yeah, fun to see. But yeah, I mean, Osama bin Laden was deeply affected by his uh, his experiences over there, and uh, he. Uh, became involved with a lot of the key figures over there, inc- including uh, uh, S- Jalud and Haqqani, which we'll we'll get into a little yeah. bit. Yeah, like so, it's funny. Al Qaeda, yeah, they they like they operate in that Fatah area, that border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. But unlike pretty much every other group there, their ideas are global, right? When you look at the structure of Al Qaeda, um, they have. You know, there's Al Qaeda, like their their central leadership. They have Al Qaeda in the Arabian Arabian Peninsula, the Islamic Maghreb, which is North Africa, uh, East Africa, which is Al Shabaab, and Indian, Indian subcontinent. subcontinent. You have uh, used to be Abu Sayyaf group, although they're more affiliated with the Islamic State now. I mean, there there's I think at current there's about a dozen subgroups. Uh, Al Qaeda in Mesopotamia, which is the Iraq Iran border, Al Qaeda or Al Qaeda in Kurdistan, sorry, that's what they are. And there there's their thing is more global, right? And they've pretty much taken advantage of Afghanistan's weak security posture for the last couple, three, four decades, three decades to operate. And and that's that's really when you get to the the crux of that relationship between Al Qaeda and the Taliban. It stretches back to those that time in the nineties where you know, like, like Stu said, in the 80s, bin Laden and all these Arabs showed up, and they didn't really do a whole lot. They just wanted to be a part of the jihad and drive out the Westerners. Um, kind of got in the way more than they helped. One thing they did provide is, like, bin Laden wasn't the only rich dude, you know. So so they brought that with them. They brought a pretty good understanding of that, that you know, Salafist Islam, which they were able to help spread. You know, like they, they had some, some benefits, just not in a military sense, right? So... The Soviet-Afghan war is over. You have the Civil War. Taliban start running shit in 96. And, I mean, they're not going to stop bin Laden and al-Qaeda from doing whatever because, you know, they, like we've talked about with Pashtun Wali before, al-Qaeda, you know, helped them out. Bin Laden helped Mullah Omar out, whether it was funds, whether it was setting up uh, communications with Pakistani ISI or other connections he may have, helping them get arms. You know there was that obligation to to lend out a hand uh, of friendship, and so Al Qaeda for years was able to operate very much you know very freely throughout Afghanistan. And you know we go in in what two thousand and one, and we start that that effort to drive out Al Qaeda. And I do remember being like my late teens, still in high school, I guess mid teens. And hearing talks about, oh, well, Al-Qaeda is, you know, it's, it's a remnant of what it was. And that probably was true in like 04, you know, 04, 05. And then, uh, like we said, Al-Qaeda being a global thing, they, they transitioned over to Iraq with AQI, started by uh, Abu Masu al-Zarqawi. And when that happens they're allowed to essentially reconstitute in Afghanistan, similar to like what Mitch said about the Taliban last time, right? They have those, those resurgences where we put, we target them for a couple of years. They are decimated. We shift focus and they regroup. And that's basically what Al Qaeda was able to do when we shifted our focus over to Iraq. Yeah. We also did them a huge favor by starting to fight the Afghan war on the super cheap. Once we did that as well. And, uh, just figured a few human sources and like I think it was a number of like fifty thousand troops, maybe it was even less yeah. than that, maybe it's like forty thousand was gonna handle the security for the whole country. Yeah, not not the not the best of ideas. Um right, but then like we, we keep going, we keep getting through the war, and one of the recurring themes of late, and we we've, we've been highly critical of it, like in the in the Doha agreement that the Taliban would be a, a partner for counterterrorism operations, right? So that Al Qaeda can't uh, reemerge. Like th- this is where there's that old ad is like Donald Trump's just he's all about making deals. It, it must be because that was a bad deal, right? Like, but it was a deal, and it makes no sense. And anybody with any understanding of how this works would have seen that 
well, that's bullshit. That's just not going to fly because those two organizations are basically, they're not one and the same in that the Taliban is Al Qaeda and that Al Qaeda is the Taliban, but Al Qaeda has pledged allegiance to the Taliban for over 20 years now, right? They, Right. And they have a specific subset of their own organization that is their liaison office, essentially, amongst other things. Yeah. So let's talk about the Haqqani Network. Yeah. So um, have you ever talked about the Haqqanis before on the show? I haven't listened to every episode yet. I'm no, still working we, on it. A little not, bit. Not, not like their history or anything. We haven't we haven't done like it. No, we haven't. Yeah, we have Okay. Yeah. So cool gotcha so it all starts with the original patriarch jalal and haqqani himself um he's mujahideen in the 1980s depending on what you read and what you believe maybe bin laden went to some of one of his training camps and they bumped into each other at some point and miram shah area in like the 80s and so he also gets linked in with the central intelligence agency receives funding, receives surface-to-air missiles, classic Mujahideen support package for 1980s anti-Soviet activities, um, does his job there. Uh, you guys covered that part, <laughs> what happened with the war of the, with the Russians. Okay, cool. So then he gets left behind from support, uh, obviously. And the important thing to know is that he is from Paktia province and his tribal area of Afghanistan that he cares the most about is a region called P2K. That's Paktika, Paktia, and Coast. And it's an area right along the border of Pakistan and specifically against the border of the federally administered tribal regions, which is a name that's a complete lie because it's not administered at all. Um, it's basically a border that Pakistan drew around its uh, Western flank and decided to let it be broken up into tribal fractions and they can rule it under tribal law. Um, so he's on the Afghanistan side of that. That's kind of the plot of territory he cares about. So when the Taliban comes to power in the mid nineties, he gets on board with their ideology. First, he's the governor of what they call Loya Paktia, which is the area of P2K. And then ironically enough, he becomes the minister of interior for the Taliban government, which is something that as of today, his son, Jalaluddin, or excuse me, Sirajuddin Haqqani has been appointed to within the current Taliban government as it stands. Um, so part of the government, U.S. invade. They actually tried to reach back out to Jalaluddin Haqqani in the uh, initial invasion and try to get him to split with the Taliban. And for whatever reason, probably because we didn't exactly support him afterwards last time and he probably felt a little jaded. That's my analytical leap. Um, he decided to stay on the Taliban side of things and was, according to Various open source reporting that you can search for yourself and some other things that, you know, people have read over the years. Uh, Haqqani facilitators may have been some of the network that was responsible for escorting high value Al Qaeda targets out of Afghanistan into Pakistan during the invasion uh, and the Battle of Tora Bora, etc. Um, because of their relationship they had across the border into Waziristan. Then hides out starts working with Taliban senior leadership. Um, it's, and over the late 2000s, before 2010, so 2008 to 2009, let's say, the group was essentially assigned the special operations role for high val or, uh, uh, what we call high profile attacks in Afghanistan that were authorized by the Taliban. Um, they were also the people responsible for any and pretty much every kidnapping operation that was said to be Americans held hostage by the Taliban. Haqqanis were also responsible for those and select assassinations of um, Afghan ministers of government and people of high rank in the military and the Afghan military. Um, and they ran extensive training camps across the Pakistani border and probably still do to this day. And then in, I believe it was 2018, Jalaluddin Haqqani finally passed of natural causes. And then his son, Sirajuddin, took over. And he's been running the organization ever since with a couple of his brothers and cousins being key figures. And he's now the Minister of the Interior, Sirajuddin. Yes, he is. Yeah, nepotism. Yeah, he just got a, <laughs> nepotism, yeah, he just got promoted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, and, and just to sum this up for the listeners too, because uh, one of our one of our listeners was like, I, I love your podcast. I have a hard time following, you know, what's going on. So you have like this, the Soviet, you know, fighting the Soviets, you have all these little groups that are, that are all there with the ultimate goal of kicking out this 
I mean, it, it's it's communism, but it's still seen as like this Western philosophy out of Afghanistan. But but after the Soviets are gone, they kind of have no idea. You know, they're, they're definitely not allied behind the same, you know, common goal. So then they start breaking up. And and it seems like immediately after that, it, it, you know, the Taliban and and, and the Haqqani network and Al Qaeda kind of all, you know, to some degree found some sort of common ground. And so so they've always been aligned with one another essentially yeah I, th- I think a lot of that is um really started in 94 like i know the the haqqani uh al-qaeda relationship goes a little further back than that but it really starts like in 94 when the taliban starts their push north well they'll push through push through kandahar then they go through zabal and all that and that's when uh jalaluddin jalaluddin however you want wherever you want to put the emphasis um <laughs> Him and him and Omar, they 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 have a common goal, right? Like you're talking about Kyle and Omar gets with Bin Laden. They've got a common goal. Like it all makes sense. Uh, I think something that you pointed out, Mitch, that I, I think maybe bears a little more a little more detail is you know, when we tried to get the Haqqanis to to break from the Taliban and talking about how they probably felt slighted after after '89 when the Soviets leave and we kind of just ignored everything. That's a that's a really good example of uh, not finishing, you know, like like just pick, taking your ball and going home at the end of the third quarter. Because when you look at something like the Soviet Afghan War and how how indirectly invested we were, like we looked at it, our mistake was looking at it from a solely anti-communist or anti-Soviet operation, and at some point we probably should have realized that there needs to be some sort of a pro Afghanistan element to that. And whether that is continuing to fund the, the Mujahideen or providing some sort of advising group to help them create essentially an Islamic Republic, which probably would have worked out like in, in hindsight, if you create an Islamic Republic where there's a level of autonomy for the Pashtuns in the South and the Tajiks in the North, that, that is probably realistic. But instead, we like, like you said, we left. Like we just straight up left, and that pissed everybody off. So then, when we come back twelve years later, like, yeah, go fuck yourself. You know, you had your chance. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna bet on this horse and see where it takes us. And we've been paying for it for well, we paid for it for twenty years. Yep, and that's why we had to go with the Northern Alliance when we were trying to come in and look for Al Qaeda. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're obviously very capable guys, but. Good luck getting Absolutely. good luck getting Tajiks to blend but, in and fucking Helmand. I know the yeah. sad part is, is this is total tangent, but after we got used them to help us, you know, invade the country and overthrow the Taliban, then we didn't really no. help them out very much after that. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like Yeah, yeah, and I'll, yeah. So, sort of along with that uh that you know, in seemingly, you know, inability or unwillingness to to see things through back in the early 90s i I believe the sudanese had um osama bin laden and they you know didn't really want him and they asked us if we wanted him and we essentially said well we we don't have enough to prosecute so not really and so everyone came together with the great idea to send him to afghanistan (laughs) (laughs) where you know he had he had ties with all a lot of influential groups there but they're like ah nothing bad can come out of afghanistan it's fine there you know they all they all love america because we helped them and then dumped them off so yeah, Osama bin Laden made his move into Afghanistan, and you know, the rest is history. I don't know about Mitch and Kyle, but Stu and I are watching the the Turning Point documentary on Netflix. And when I saw that, I went to the NCTC, which is the National Counterterrorism Center website. And for the record, pretty decent open source, like quick introduction to these groups is the National Counterterrorism Center. And I went there and I was like, when was uh, Sudan designated a state sponsor of terrorism? And it was like before they kicked bin Laden out. It was like, like middle or late 93. Isn't that right around the same time they kick him out? Like he can't be a state sponsor of terrorism. And they're like, hey, we're trying to get this guy out of here. You can have him. He's responsible for what happened at the World Trade Center. And like, ah, we don't have enough on it. He can go to Afghanistan and fuck off over there. Or build Omar a compound with some German engineers. Who gives a shit? Yeah, I mean it's kind of a it's kind of a comedy 
or tragedy of errors, I should say, <laughs> you know, not necessarily a comedy. Yeah. It's a, we, we made a lot of mistakes leading up to that. And, and it goes back to what we've pretty much hammered this entire time we've had this podcast is, is a lack of understanding of, of that situation. I, I, I don't, you know, it's easy, like we said, when Mitch was on last time, it's easy to go in and, and kill people. We're, we are very good at killing people. We have the best technology. I mean, we're the best. I mean, we're very good at it. But what we're not good at doing is apparently getting people together who have an idea of what's going on in that country. Because, um, I mean, I mean, we, we saw that up to, up to last, you know, the extraction of everybody. We, we still didn't know what was going on. We still didn't know how fast the the ANA would just simply surrender to the Taliban. You know, there, there's a misunderstanding, I think, of that culture and of that that civilization that we that, that we don't understand, and I don't think we will ever understand it. And it's and there's so many missed opportunities along the way that, in hindsight, you're just like, I can't believe we did that. You know. So something something I see, and this is on the on the Haqqani Network page on the National Counterterrorism Center. And the page is ran by the DNI, which was the Directorate of National Intelligence. It's a, yeah, it's, it's, a, right. it's either directorate or department. I'm pretty sure it's directorate of national intelligence. It's a government fucking like entity. Like they're a part of the intelligence community. And this is what it says. Very first sentence of the last paragraph. The U S government in 2012 designated the Haqqani network as a foreign terrorist organization because of its involvement in the Afghan insurgency, attacks on U.S. military and civilian personnel and Western interests in Afghanistan, and because of its ties to the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. It's right fucking there, right? But there are still people just blustering on the news, and not just people who are paid to be reporters, but politicians, maybe even presidents, who are going around saying that this is a non-existent relationship. When their own intelligence community, uh, like separate from the four of us, but you know the intelligence community writ large, is saying that this is absolutely a relationship that exists, and we need to stop pretending that it doesn't exist. And that's how you get people like Lindsey Graham saying, "Oh, we're going to go back to Afghanistan." He could pick up the first fucking rifle if he wants to go to Afghanistan. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's just baffling to, because so like like when I mean when all of us were were going over there and you know if, if you ever worked in the the P two K area, I mean it's it's clear as day like like you everyone knows for a fact that the Haqqani and Taliban are allied. You know even even when we'd when we'd capture Haqqani guys, they would say they were Taliban because that's the overarching group. The Haqqani is not even necessarily like a splinter group there or, or an even allied group. They, they're sort of encapsulated by the Taliban overall. They're just a specific section of it almost. Right. And that's totally correct. Weird. It's not like Siraj has like an email distro that says only the Haqqani group guys, like it's all <laughs> Taliban, you know, and yeah. uh, we saw the move a couple of years ago when he was appointed to be in charge of the Peshawar Shura, which is the Taliban's military Shura, not Haqqani's military Shura, not whoever's, it's the Taliban's and he's the guy running it. And it's it's a seamless organization, but not even politicians, Zach, to your point. I remember commanders that I had in been really good organizations uh still could not understand the difference between or understand there was no difference between the taliban and, Haqq and the haqqani it was just a designation that we gave the network because of the head you know the head and family being the haqqanis and their operations but by no means does the enemy look at it that way so we created that term and that's created the confusion and so when someone who hasn't followed Afghanistan in the news for 10 years suddenly gets a story about a Haqqani network and CNN, they're going to run with it and just say, oh, well, this must be some new group. What's the Haqqani network? So the yeah. uh, that's a good point. The Haqqani network is really like the paramilitary wing of Al-Qaeda because Al-Qaeda in that Afghanistan, Pakistan, like along the Fatah, is not beefed up like Haqqani is and stuff like that. Like for the most part, that's where Zahiri probably is and there are fighters up there right but they're, they're not deep like the taliban and haqqani are it's a lot of the the policy makers and the decision makers that are there and they yeah they certainly use haqqani to like help fulfill some of their uh military related goals along with some other groups that we'll get into here shortly as well there are two differences between haqqani and al-qaeda 
and they mean nothing. One of them, well, one of them, like I said, they're the paramilitary wing. The other one is that uh, pretty much all the Haqqani networks Afghans. It might be Al Qaeda guys in the Middle East or in uh, in Pakistan. You know, Zawahiri's from Egypt. His deputies from Yemen. I don't know if he's even there. He might still be in Yemen, actually. But for the most part, not a lot of local like South Central Asians rolling in the AQ leadership in the Fatah. Yeah, yeah. I mean the 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 big benefit that so so there there aren't like like a huge amount of Al Qaeda fighters that got involved with the uh the war in afghanistan primarily what al-qaeda does is they provide training camps and um uh with with their the large amount of uh of, of funds that they have as basically like a gigantic multinational criminal organization they're able to bring in experts and like bomb bomb making and stuff like that and that's why after we got involved in iraq where they sort of um experimented with IEDs for the first time, as far as I know, that was the first time U S troops started running into them that made it back to um, Afghanistan because those same trainers were able to bring their teachings over to them. And, and yeah, to, yeah, of course, Al, Al Qaeda has the big, you know, Arab oil money supporting it. Right. And, and Haqqani is, is a bunch of local Afghan, you know, a very powerful Afghan family, you know, so it's, it's not really fair to compare the two. I don't think. Uh, With a little bit of love from the Gulf nation states that donate to oh, the well, Doha. A little bit. <laughs> Can't forget That's that. true. Just a little but, bit. But all yeah. the Al Qaeda money and all that Arab money trickles down somewhere. It's got to go oh, somewhere. Yeah. It's, yeah. And, and, yeah. and you get that ISI swag money every now and then. Oh man, that's a good talking point. If people say trickle down <laughs> economics doesn't work. Yeah, it depends on what nation you live in, I suppose. Yeah, but like it's, yeah. It, it, it's, it's really, I do think it's, it, it's a pretty simple, like if you just look at it objectively, it's, it's pretty obvious, right? How these groups are just intertwined, and I don't say that because we're analysts and we have access to classified information. The shit's unclassified. Like the, Siraj Akhani yeah. wrote that fucking op-ed in the New York Times about what the Taliban wants. It's like Siraj Akhani yeah. is a member of the Taliban Peshwar Shur and the leader of the Akhani network. And we know that the Akhani network is tied and aligned to Al Qaeda. And we know that Siraj Akhani is like the military commander for Al Qaeda and sat on the Peshwar Shur as well as the Kedah Shur. Like it's all right there. It, all you got to do is read it. But enough about <laughs> the Akhani nonsense. <laughs> Let's talk about Hezbi, Azami, yeah. Gobadin. Well, I was just going to say, you know, it's interesting just to kind of add one more point and then we can transition sure. to what you just said sure. is I was I just typed into Google just to see Haqqani Network Brothers and it like you go down and it's like, yeah, Jalaluddin, Khalil, you know, his, his uncle, Haji Mali Khan. It's like all the names that, you know, from like the other side of life, like they're totally on Google, man. Yeah. And it's like, no, like there's somebody who did really good research here in order to find this and publish it. It's pretty solid stuff. Nobody reads it. No. Nope. Why would they? Hey, it, yeah. turn it into a stop go chart, please. Can we turn that PowerPoint slide <laughs> green? I don't have time to read this stuff. Oh, man. I was explaining yeah, I to my wife <laughs> yeah, how PowerPoint artistic skills work. And she was like, how do you do that? And I was like, imagine you had six months worth of analytical effort. You had to display to a human being in less than one minute. And it had to be artsy. I was like, that's why I can make what I can make on PowerPoint. Make sure it's got transitions. Yeah, absolutely. Some background music, but you can swing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So you wanted to go on to yeah, his deck? Is that the next one? Yeah. Oh man, that guy, dude. What a, what a one eighty. So the Hig yeah. is, yeah, the yeah, is um, Hezbi Islami Golbatin. Hezbi Islami, as we've mentioned before, is like what the the party of Islam, and it was a political organization started in the seventies by Burr Newton. Rabani, who would eventually become the president of Afghanistan. He started at Kabul University. Two of the more well-known members of Hezbi Islami were Ahmad Shah Massoud and Gobuddin Hekmatyar. And Gobuddin Hekmatyar became a face of the uh, resistance toward, against the Soviets during the Afghan-Soviet war. And I believe uh, was the largest benefactor 
of U.S. aid in terms of money, which obviously turned into weapons and shit like that. And True. it also turned out that Golbudin Hekmatyar is about as radical as Al Qaeda and the Taliban are. Which just yeah. for some and reason to like provide them. an initial analogy, we talked about the Hakanis last time caring about P2K. His original stopping ground was like N2K, so Nangahar, Nuristan, and Kunal. Yeah, yeah. We, I, I learned that when we were doing some some research on him. I didn't realize that he was born in Kunduz and shit. But, but his dad is from that East Afghan border area, so that's why he cared mm-hmm. about that shit later on, right? That's where all those people went. Yeah, one time we were flying some ISR and saw a hate flag next to an ISIS flag, and that was interesting. <laughs> Well, I, I I think I read somewhere that he did yeah. at one point he he didn't pledge like allegiance to, but he he like supported ISIS. Yeah, and Kunar because like he's like I don't know, you guys are Salafi jihadists. I can get behind that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, the, the, it makes sense because the 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 Hig definitely took the took the worst of it when when the Taliban came into power, and yeah. I, don't know, I, I was reading somewhere that <clears throat> that. They were saying the the Hig and the Taliban were considered allied groups. Oh no, it was Wikipedia. Yeah. So this is why you don't <laughs> trust oh, everything no. you read on Wikipedia. They were they were saying that the Hig and the Taliban were allied groups up till like 2016. But no, they've been they'd been killing each other for for years before them. And the Hig were were basically decimated by the time I came uh, into the country on my first deployment in 2012 and they they really were kind of a kind of a non-factor outside of you know some uh some guerrilla actions and trying to conduct some some se- semi like medium to large um uh vbid attacks if they could get them off but yeah they they were they were having to deal with both us and the taliban it was rough and that's an interesting group. that's funny go ahead mitch sorry uh, go no you oh, go for it i was gonna say like hey go, when we were there um and one of my my jobs screen wide analysts was i was there when uh heck matyar basically reconciled with the government of afghanistan so uh, it, it's an it's an interesting it's an interesting group because um we, we talked last week about Ahmad Shah Massoud, and we talked about uh, him and Hik Matyar having kind of a a very different opinion. And and the Hig group is interesting because, you know, you have these people aligned against the government we set up, essentially, like you know Al Qaeda, the Taliban, um, uh, the Hig, you know Hik Matyar's group. They're aligned against the government we set up, but Hik Matyar is not aligned with these other groups against the government. He's just he's an anti-government group but isn't necessarily like linked up with the Taliban. So, so he's kind of like an odd, kind of an odd man out. And heck, Matyar is responsible for a whole lot of horrible things that happened in Afghanistan. Uh, basically the siege of Kabul. I mean, a lot of warlords yep. were, but he's one of the big ones. And so people in Afghanistan absolutely hate him. If you're a citizen of Kabul, you do not like him. So uh, in 2016, yeah, he reconciled with the Afghan government and Ghani allowed him to basically come into the government. Um, and and I don't know what he's up to right now. I should have looked that up. He ran episode. for president you know, in 2019. Yeah, I was going to ask if anybody knew how he's doing now because I would imagine he probably jetted out on like a private chain to like Belarus like a week before this happened. I don't, I don't think he hung around because you know, like you know, like you alluded to, he's never really been super friendly with the Taliban. I mean, when the civil war was going on, the three bigger factions was Hekmatyar, Aman Shah Massoud, and the Taliban. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, I can't imagine he wants to be there when, like, Raider comes back through the doors. <laughs> yeah, he just he, he just yeah, had that, a glow up, rough. you know, and made good with the government, mm-hmm. and then the government fell. So now I don't know what he's going to do. He was yeah. prime minister yeah. twice well, in the He's 90s. doing interviews with Netflix. That's true. He, he did. Yeah. Oh. yeah he, did he really? Yeah. So for this Turning yeah, yeah. Point documentary, he sits down. Okay, I haven't started watching it yet. He sits down and he does an interview. And I, I thought it was interesting. They, uh. They, they, they go to a slide or a, a page like here's to understand the Mujahideen, you have to understand like the moderate faction and the Islam or the extremist faction or the radical faction, I guess. And they show like the radical faction and it's like uh, Rabani, Hekbatyar, uh, Abu Razul Saif, who has the best fucking beard I have ever seen. And some fourth guy that I don't really care about, but I really wanted them to talk about the other three. But they just, yeah, they, they fucking sit down with Golbat and Hekbatyar and... They're talking to him about it, and he's like, "God, this guy was such a fucking asshole." And he was the prime minister twice. 
How's his English? Uh, he doesn't speak in English. Uh, he okay. takes questions. I don't know if he takes questions in English or they do that just for production quality, but yeah. the, the questions are presented in English. He's a big poetry fan. I do know that he's like huge into poetry. Probably comes from his time at, at Kabul University there and under um, Rabani or whatever. But um, Oh, man. Yeah, he's did, a big poet. Did you guys ever hear about the dude Muslim Dost? He was an old school Taliban slash AQ slash a little ISIS. He wrote a book, a, po- a poetry book in uh, in Guantanamo Bay called like Break Me Free of Chains or Breaker of Chains or something like that. Did you read Is it? it good? Oh, I never read it, no, <laughs> but I, I heard about yeah. it. And then they were like, yeah, you'll never believe it. It's a full on poetry book. And I was like, that's so we've got it. If, if I buy it, man. will they put me on a list? It's... I mean, I'm probably already on that <laughs> list anyways. Yeah. I mean, Ro- based off your Google history. <laughs> R- Roman Polanski made some good movies, but you know. Look at him. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe it's a good book. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. Yeah. Good. That, that, that kind of sounds like his version of Mein Kampf. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> All I wanted to do was kill those who didn't want to follow my brand of Islam. What's so wrong with that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but man, yeah, yeah. Heck, Matiar, like, like the, the the level of hatred that people have for him, especially in, in Kabul, like it exceeds uh, how much they hate Dostum and that it takes a lot to get there. I mean, he was he was launching rockets at Kabul for yeah. weeks, like like complete destruction. I'm sure his engineering uh, knowledge came into play there because he was an engineer. Hardline so, Islam, but, too, responsible for throwing a lot of acid in girls' faces for not wearing like burqas and covering up all the way, too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What an absolute yeah. lunatic. Ugh. So. Hopefully he's, I don't know, hanging from a light pole somewhere, but he's probably safe in Qatar. Uh, yeah. Probably. Uh, see, I, um, I don't see anything that says he's left Afghanistan. Oh, it says he's things. heading for Doha with Karzai. That was three weeks ago, so that might have been for like oh, East cool. Coast or something. Oh, Never mind. Wouldn't that be a super rad flight, G5 flight to be on? ISI chief. Has, has Karzai said anything? No. Him and okay. Abdullah Abdullah were in the news for a little bit, like at the immediate fall. They were posting, or their teams were posting shit on like Instagram about, oh, we're having this meeting with the Taliban. We're having this meeting with the Taliban. Like they're going back and forth from Kabul and Doha, and then like they just dropped off the face of the fucking planet. Yeah, his his problem is that he's completely useless to the Taliban because his area, his area of influence is their area of influence, so yep. it doesn't really help there. Yep. Who's the next so, terrorist group in the list? We talked about old, you know, lone man Hekmat Yar. Uh, who else we got <laughs> on the list? Uh, I am oh, you. Yeah. Oh man, that's a fun classic. One. Yeah. Do you yeah. want to introduce the IMU, Mitch? Uh, yeah, I think I can do that uh, off the top of my Their head. Their origin so story is awesome. Yeah, as you can probably guess, they were originated in the country of Uzbekistan. Uh, and uh, mid to late 90s. The Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. For Yeah, the they stand for the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, but because we were the U.S. government slash military, we had to turn it into an acronym. Um, but that is good because to type that out every time would definitely take longer than necessary. So the IMU was founded by a guy named Tolhir Yuldashev. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, he's one of the founders. The other guy, I don't even know. One try. of the founders. I can't remember the other guys. Yeah, it's really crazy. The, the Soviet uh, drafty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they they come up in the 90s and they start doing, you know, terrorists, you know, Mujahideen style stuff around IMU, around, around uh, Uzbekistan, excuse me. And then so eventually they start doing operation against the network and they are kicked back to Afghanistan. Uh, in the operations, that's when Tohir Yudashev was killed, yep. correctly, or was he killed back in Afghanistan? I always forget that. And so anyway, he had a son at the time. Eventually, his son takes over his organization many years later. However, they come over. They kind of set up shop in northeastern Afghanistan, which makes sense, near the province of Faryab, if you guys are familiar geographically with how Afghanistan lies. Um, it's closer to the, uh, the Uzbekistan area. But then, ironically enough, when the GWAT broke out, uh, a healthy amount of IMU operatives, families, and personnel moved to Zabul, yep. Paktika, and Waziristan and actually began uh, conducting operations and hosting training camps and providing facilitation for Al-Qaeda operatives. Um, for those of you who spent time in the south or the east of Afghanistan, you're aware of a certain facilitation route that comes across from Helmand through Bandy Timor, then goes up through Zabul. 
and then comes down to Southern Paktika, which is no man's land that no one ever goes through. And then it takes you out into the Fata, again, into a place that no one ever goes through. And IMU and AQIS was responsible for maintaining that line for the majority of 2008 to 2014. So when some AQ heavy hitters are trying to move back and forth into the Fata, into Afghanistan. I was thinking, so you can imagine their relationship was quite important. I was thinking about that trail the other day, like in prep. And I was like, what the fuck is that yeah. trail? Redacted. 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 Yeah. Oh, like we found like a an old like AQ guys like thumb drive that had the fucking KMZ with that trail on it or some shit. Yeah, yeah. That was awesome. Redacted. Redacted. Oh, you know, probably don't say that target name. It was just a bunch of people was, being wrong. Baghdad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Right. Take it away, Mitch. Uh yeah, so IMU ended up having a pretty important relationship with Al Qaeda, as you can imagine, holding down, you know, that territory. Um, but ironically enough, um, Al Qaeda started to lose its kind of luster 2014 timeframe or so with a lot of local Afghan insurgents and not like Al Qaeda branches or supporters, but Al Qaeda core um, because there just hasn't been, or excuse me, hadn't been anything to kind of inspire its followers or people who were trying to facilitate. They were actually starting to run a little low on funding um, and it wasn't as uh, shiny of an object as it used to be. So then around 2015, the Tariqi Taliban from Pakistan, also known as the Pakistani Taliban, uh, is fracturing apart into separate groups. And one of their groups decides to pledge to the Islamic State of um, the Levant in Iraq and Syria. And they stand up what is called the ISIS Khorasan branch. Khorasan's like the Afghanistan, Pakistan, a little bit of eastern Iran kind of area on Islamic maps. And a large amount of IMU personnel are also super down with ISIS's message of transformation. They're getting suddenly a lot of funding from ISIS Corps in Syria and Iraq. They're getting some trainers. They are setting up shop in an area of Southern Nangahar and owning a literal multiple districts of an Afghan province. Um, dogs. And so IMU is suddenly very stoked on this. And the interesting part is a couple of key, uh, key leaders decided to stay on IMU's side, one of them being Tohir Yuldashevs, the founding guy that we mentioned earlier, son. Um, but the current emir at the time and his second in charge left the group and joined ISIS and went to Nangahar, essentially splintering the group in half. And when this leadership used to exist in Zabul and Ghazni area, uh, they moved back to like the Faryab region of Afghanistan, so northeastern or northwestern Afghanistan. Because a large cadre of their members had just joined ISIS K in Angahar. And and one of the, the big reasons for that split is um Mullah Mansour and the Taliban hiding Omar's yeah. death. Which I remember reading about that, like when I was getting read up on IMU and stuff going to Kandahar, which obviously not a big issue down there, but I want you want to know all the groups. I was like, Yeah, Omar dies, they hide it for two years and like a lot of the guy, IMU guys were fucking pissed about that because there is this, there is this trend that Al Qaeda was losing their their like worldwide factions because of how fast the Islamic State was rolling through northern Iraq and people were playing the momentum game, right? So they they jumped on that train, we'll go up to Nangahar, like you said, and we didn't really see a whole hell of a lot of IMU for a little bit. Um, but they're they're certainly still around, and, and kind of like Hakani, they're better trained, um, not probably not better funded, right? But they're better trained, and it's a testament to the permissive environment that the original Taliban government had, right? Because you know they're up at their their thing was they wanted to establish an Islamic caliphate in Uzbekistan, yep. and they got pushed out of Uzbekistan, and Omar and the Taliban government of Afghanistan, like, oh, you want to conduct jihad? Sure, yeah, come on down. Right? They, they didn't care if you, as long as you wanted to conduct jihad, they let you come yeah. in, right? And that was a that was a relationship. For what, fifteen years, fourteen yeah. years before before Mansoor possibly kills Omar and you know keeps it a secret for two years, and they get all pissy about it. And, and then Usman Ghazi, yeah, that, I couldn't remember the Emir's name. Yeah. Usman Ghazi, that was him. He was a guy yeah. who's like, man, that's whack, bro. I'm gonna go join ISIS now. And the other thing that kind of speaks to their capabilities. Was when they joined ISIS in Nangahar, instead of just being general fighters, most of the IMU dudes were chosen to be like training cadre and like 
teach you how to build bombs. And then they were even folded into some like mid to high senior leadership positions. Those guys were wild because I talked to uh, several, you know, Green Berets. I was working with in 2015. We did uh, ISR support for them. And um, they'd be out and they'd be like, well, you know, there's a big difference between, you know, Taliban fighters and people, you know, you got some redheaded dude out there, you know, bounding and covering, you know, doing yeah. actual battle drills. Like, you know, you were in trouble when you're out there fighting and these guys are, you know, covering each other while they bound and, move, you know, it's, Bro, it's wild. Yeah. Wild. When I was in Zabal, I was attached to uh, an ODA and we went up to what the hell was the name of that province? They, they show pants. We went and did a, a mission in Daeshopan right before the election. And we're up in the support by fire overlooking where they're doing the clearance. I was carrying a wolfhound, you know, the fucking Sigint thing that you listen to. And I would like hear this like really crazy, like jumbled noise every now and then. And I was like, what the fuck is that? And then sometimes it'd be like, you know, mooch talk or just like general personal radio chatter. And then, then this weird noise. We got back to the uh, base after we were we exfilled and I looked it up and it was encrypted communication, like not like um, Harris radio encryptions, but encrypted ICOM communications. And then uh, like it, it, there was a bunch of human reports about fucking IMU fighters with encrypted ICOMs all around Zobel. I was like, oh, well, that makes fucking sense now. You know, the Taliban doesn't fight like that. They don't really think about that next level shit. Yeah, if you get a Tajik in southern Afghanistan, there's like a hundred percent chance they're part of the Afghan National Army. If you get some ginger redhead fuck from like the northern Congress, oh, fuck yeah, Russia, dude. and and they're down in Zabal, Chechen, there is a one hundred percent chance. Yeah, well, you yeah, guys that they are not yeah, there. To you make guys friends. probably saw you know at least a dozen, if not a, a hundred or two hundred fucking reports talking about Chechens in Afghanistan training people. Mm-hmm. It was always definitely some IMU dude. You know what I'm saying? Training stuff. Yeah. They're just like, I don't know. He's redheaded. He sounds Russian. God. That's basically the same thing. Close right? enough. Yeah. Uh, but it's, so you have the IMU. And, and like you said, like they, they go, they, they split with the Taliban. They join the Islamic State of the Khorasan province. So that is an, an interesting development like we're 15 14 years into this into this conflict and then all of a sudden you have this big al-qaeda split in iraq and syria where basically what had happened was in 2006 what was the what was al-qaeda in iraq consolidated with like five other groups and became the islamic state of iraq and you know did a lot of suicide attacks targeting shia thing you know the thing typical Sunni Arab Islamic extremist groups do. And then the surge happened. And one of the good things about the surge is it did push them uh, out of like Baghdad and made them a lot less capable in terms of spectacular attacks uh, to the point that when I was in Iraq, I was the, the threat analyst dealing with uh, Sunni uh, extremist groups or Sunni insurgent groups, which was mostly like just tracking whenever Al Qaeda or ISI, as they were called then, was sending foreigners in to become fucking suicide bombers, right? And we were pretty good. We had a, a pretty, half, half decent success rate in interdicting that shit, right? But that's really what the ISI was by the time we left Iraq. And that's because what they've been doing was really just focusing on consolidating their power base up in Syria. And ultimately, Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, who was the emir, um, went insane, I, I guess is, is one way to put it, declared himself the the uh, the emir of the caliphate and said that al-Qaeda basically wasn't extreme enough and created the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. And holy fuck, they rolled through most of Syria, like eastern Syria, northern Iraq. We, we all know they pushed down through Mosul. And like we talked about it with, you know, if I'm a 17 year old Afghan kid, am I going to join the Taliban or the ANA? Right, it's that same concept. I can I can be a part of the team that I know is going to get their fucking asses handed to them, or I can be a part of the winning side, right? And so you saw all these Al Qaeda groups start to leave AQ and start pledging allegiance to ISIL, and some of them have come back, but for the most part, they all left. Abu Sayyaf group down in the Philippines is no longer associated with Al Qaeda; they're a part of ISIL. And then with that, you saw the IMU, like you said, Mitch, they um, left the Taliban, 
or left that Taliban Al Qaeda allegiance, joined ISIL. And then it seemed like there was just this organic creation of the Islamic State of the Khorasan province. Like, do you can you recall which groups it was other than the IMU that that created this new like problem? Yeah. So to like set the stage for the full story, um, so this is like 2014, towards the end of 2014, when the group kind of comes together, right? But the, so I said it in the previous segment, Tariqi Taliban, Pakistan, Pakistani version of the Taliban. They have the same intent that the Afghan Taliban has just for Pakistan. Um, in 2009, its leader, Batullah Masood, is killed. In 2013, its leader, Haki Mulamas. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, me too. We well, were at the, the ace. We were at, yeah, Bragg. We were at the ace. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, and then in 2013, his heir apparent and brother, Haki Mullah Masood, is then killed again. So, and... Now they're thinking the next Masood brother is going to be in line, and he doesn't get appointed to be ahead of the TTP. Instead, a guy named Mullah Flazula from Bajar Agency is placed in charge of the TTP, and this pisses off everybody in the TTP. So the TTP is structured to where you have the emir of the group, and then each faction of the TTP is the tribal area. So think of the same difference as if the Fatah is a province— a uh, faction or an agency would be a district. So the Orikzai district in the central part of the Fata was a very, like, pretty strong faction of the TTP led by a dude named Hafiz Said Khan. So he gets, inter- like, I- involved with some uh, dudes who are doing uh, media for the TTP that have connection to uh, ISIL in Syria and Iraq. And they select this faction of TTP to be the branch to establish ISIS in the Khorasan area because of they had some good media capabilities, they were pretty fucking devout, and they were capable of fighting. So while they select this faction, they also bring in other people almost immediately. So the Orgzai faction comes over, uh, Mangle Boggs group, I can't remember their name off the top of my head, uh, out of Khyber, pretty, doesn't pledge but they join and start helping out militarily then the bajra agency of ttp joins as well led by abu Bakr bajuri and then and then this is the big one that made the big difference that in, and gave them a lot more military capabilities the imu people start coming in from southeastern afghanistan into nangahar bolstering out the leadership and then suddenly they have this critical mass hanging out in the tira valley in the kyber agency on the southern side of nangahar province in eastern afghanistan and they roll over into a Chin district and they take over a Chin district, Bandar district, and Debala district, not all within like three days, but in a pretty quick succession and essentially set up the ISIS governance system in a uh, semi autonomous country uh, and, and southern Nangahar across these three districts that are also, ironically enough, the same swath of territory where the Battle of Tora Bora uh, was going on. <laughs> It it never fails to amaze me that you have these like you've got the Hig who like they don't like the Taliban because they pretty much went to war with each other. I get that, but then you have like the Islamic State of the Khorasan province, and you have the IMU, and you have the Taliban, and you have Al Qaeda, and you have all these different groups. Like what you all want the same. Yeah, thing. but they don't want it in the same way, and their way is better than your way. Yeah, yeah it's ridiculous. Yeah, it, it, it's. And and TTP is a, is a funny one you bring up. So we talk about like the Pakistani Taliban, and we mentioned that you know that's Pakistan's big counterterrorism problem, right? They got to deal with TTP oh, yeah, all dude. the time. Well, TTP they they may not be uh, super cozy with the Taliban, but they're not uncozy with Al Qaeda. Oh right? yeah, no, so that's, definitely not. That's a very unique relationship. Yeah. So right just there. like the IMU facilitated, we talked about like TTP. Um, so TTP has the same relationship with Af- or had because NDS doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, but TTP had a very similar relationship to NDS in Afghanistan that the Afghan Taliban had with ISI in Pakistan. Um, so, you know, that's both good and bad um, for her NDS. However, what that proves to uh, the access that the TTP guys had is they could go back and forth across the border freely. Um, when we would conduct raids in, in the Ranger Regiment, like if you pull a guy off of the objective and you had a TTP ID card, he was going to get released from Parwan the next day. It was just like a known thing. Yeah. Uh, so you wouldn't even take them. Um, so when 
AQ was trying to move into northeastern Afghanistan out of the FATA when they were told that they needed to command from in, inside Afghanistan, a lot of the guys like Mullah Fazula were responsible for a lot of those movements. And when people were looking for, like, you know, dudes who, like, were in bin Laden's inner circle or one hop outside of that, a lot of these TTP guys were the anchor point that they used to find al-Qaeda operatives from, let's call it, about 08 to 14 or so. Yeah. That yeah. Sounds about right. I mean, it, it's a it's a very very weird dynamic. And there's that video, like after the Taliban took over Afghanistan last month, where like they're on the border with Pakistan, there and like the Taliban's highly decentralized, right? So it, it, they don't speak for everybody, but they're sitting there talking to the Pakistani army, like you're next, like no, they yeah, you, dude. exactly. <laughs> you don't have yeah. that option, right now. It might be interesting to see what that means for the relationship with, like, the TTP. Um, I know that, you know, they'll uh, they'll be cool with, you know, them helping out the LET, which LET, Lashkar, is Taiba, sponsored by down in Afghanistan, Pakistan. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. The Pac- it's, it's Pakistan's little... Uh, uh, State-sponsored terrorist, terrorist group. Yeah. <laughs> yep. State-sponsored terrorism, and they are not a state-sponsored terrorism, according to the National Counterterrorism sure. Center. But Syria has been since 1979. Yeah, it's interesting. Who did the Mumbai thing again? Who was that? Yeah, that okay. Was just wondering. Hey, just, just like Kissinger said, the old bastard, he said, America does not have allies. It has interests. <laughs> and, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's and that's pretty much, yeah, America doesn't have friends. It has interests or something like that. And that's yeah. how that's how Pakistan is. And that's why it's not a state yeah. sponsor of terror, even though they do that every day. Yeah, so it's it's oh, it's it's stupid. Like, and so, long story short, we're we're kind of coming up on our hour. Let's see, we got Al Qaeda, Taliban, Haqqani Network. It's basically all the same thing. They are different. They are separate. In entities. Afghanistan, they, they in have Asia. a very deep working relationship. Yes, they do. I mean, it, you don't get much more closer in terms of working together than those three groups. I mean, going Siraj Khani, deputy commander, deputy leader of the Taliban, who's now the minister of interior, which I didn't know Afghanistan had national parks, if it's anything like our interior department. Um, but, you know, it's cool. I'm I'm sure he wanted something like, what, what was his dad, the... Uh, borders and tri- tribal affairs. So I saw that he was the governor the of Loya Paktia and then he was the minister of tribal yeah. affairs, but then apparently he also was the minister yeah. of interior. Yeah. So, well, in Afghanistan, like the minister of tribal affairs is really just like you get to run Southeast Afghanistan, which is what he wanted. Yeah, anyways. fair enough. You know, um, so like those three all work together. They have a relationship with groups like LET, TTP, uh, they they used to have one with the IMU. They still like there's still some IMU factions that fight with the Taliban. Yeah. And then, so when the ISIS yeah. had that pocket of uh, fighters in Jalzjan, I don't know if you guys remember that at all. Um, it was IMU and Taliban. Obviously, we did the airstrikes and a couple of raids on HVTs, but the ground fighting, the lion share of it, was done by the Taliban and IMU. Oh, and also, one quick anecdote, if we're talking about group allegiances and stuff, when ISIS was finally cleared out of southern Nangahar, it wasn't U.S. ground forces, and it wasn't the ODAs that cleared all the way down Moment Valley that finished it off. It was the Taliban. The ODAs cleared a couple spots. We cleared a couple spots. We shot some bombs, dropped some bombs, and then the Taliban cleared them out the rest of the way. I, I remember when, like, when all this shit happened with the suicide, with the, with the VBID, last last month and we had like uh political commentators on cna like does this mean we're going to get in bed with the taliban to counter isil k or isis k probably like, did you know what you don't need to <laughs> i'm like you know what that's 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 no longer a stupid yeah. question <laughs> i mean have you seen what the u.s government does we'll probably do that even if, like good idea bad Dude. idea we'll do it, like, it rel taliban thing. tear line is a thing <laughs> oh yeah Oh, yeah. Well, because I remember for the longest time, it was just like, you know what? Just let them fucking yeah. kill each other. I mean, they're going and to then anyway. Yeah. I, yeah, but then ISIS-K started to win a little more. Like, oh, we don't want them to win. We want the other guys. Like, somebody's got to win. Let, you know, let it be those guys. Oh, they just, like, 
throw gay people off of buildings. They don't set them on fire before <laughs> they do it. Like you yeah. have to rationalize. Like, that's a little like too that. hardcore over here, fellas. <laughs>